Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this is a video intended for my AP Biology class. And in this video, underneath the umbrella of Unit 4 still, we're going to focus on cells, mitosis, and the control of the cell cycle, and relate this back to cell communication, which is the big, uh, big ticket um, for this unit. So let me put myself in presentation mode. And get rid of this and also down below you will find in the descriptors the notes that my students use it's two column notes one column you fill in and the second column is open to add in pictures and images that are helpful um, with the information so this is chapter nine for my students and um, this is a cell going through mitosis we'll talk about the stages and the controls of that and here you can see an overview so this right here is the cell cycle. You can see the bulk of it is right here, interphase, and you can see G1, S, and G2. When you think about a cell undergoing mitosis and actually visibly seeing chromosomes, those rod-shaped chromosomes, this is obviously a eukaryotic cell, the actual nuclear division is just mitosis, the division of the nucleus, and we'll learn about those stages and what controls all of those aspects. That is in part one. Um, video two, which I'll make next, is going to talk about when you don't have that control and cancer. All right. So um, part one, cell cycle and mitosis. Um, here, I've got a little baby. And when you think about this baby growing, all right, the type of division it will do is mitosis. The way I teach this in class is my arms, my legs, mitosis. So you're making more cells in your body cells. Um, and those are called somatic cells. My, oh my, meiosis is getting ready for reproduction. And we will hit that in unit five. So the first thing on your notes in the cell cycle is from the moment the cell forms until it's own division into two cells. That is the cell cycle. So let me get you a picture of that. Okay. So um, the cell cycle is from the moment the cell forms until its own division into two cells. Now I'm going to come back to these notes in a minute. I'm going to go over a few pictures with you first. So take a look at this bigger outer circle. You can see where it says it's interphase. Interphase is actually one of the busiest stages of the cell, though when you look at it from all appearances, it's very quiet. When you're looking at the cell, um, it's divided into three parts, G1, S, and G2. Um, and 90%, this model doesn't show you this, but about 90% of the cell's time is spent in interphase and just 10% spent in mitosis, which is focusing just on the division of the nucleus. So let's look. G1, during this stage of interphase, these are when cells go. Remember, you just finished mitosis right here, and then you're transitioning into G1. So your cells are very small, so they're going to get bigger during this stage, and they're going to make more organelles because you just divided your organelles in half right here when you finished up cytokinesis, which is division of the cytoplasm. In the S stage of interphase, this is when your DNA in your cell is going to double up. You're going to take all your DNA, and you're going to make two copies of that, and I'll be teaching you how to do that um, shortly. All right. And then in G2, this is when you're doing a lot of protein synthesis, getting ready for the climactic event of mitosis and cytokinesis. I want to reiterate, mitosis is division of the nucleus and cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. Now, did this is a little graphic just to kind of walk you through the stages. So let's take a look here. This big outer, uh, big black line on the outside, that would represent um, the cell membrane. The dashed line in here, just a minute, I need to get, I need to get a pointer. Hang on just a minute here. Sorry, sorry, delay of game. Oh, Mrs. Sloan, your pointer's down here. Sorry. So sorry. Okay, so this dashed line right here, that would be the nuclear envelope. These colored items in here would be chromosomes. Um, I know these are terrible, but this is supposed to be right here. Any guesses? That'd be like a vacuole or something. And then hopefully you know these are mitochondria, and these little guys are here are proteins, obviously not drawn to scale. They're way, way too large. Okay, but in G1, if you'll notice, I made more organelles. So that's what happens during G1, just your organelles double. Following G1 is the S stage. And during the S stage, this is when your DNA doubles up. So you can see each chromosome now has two copies of itself, right? And then in G2, this is when you make several more proteins is what you would have, all right? So here, 
Um, following that, then you would do cytokinesis where you would make two cells. So you can see you have separated out. Remember, let me just go back here. See how you had two copies? Mitosis is specifically separating those copies from each other. And, uh, and so that's the dividing of the nucleus. And then cytokinesis is everything else that you're dividing, the rest of the cells. So now you have two cells and they have the contents of our original cell. Okay, so on our notes for G1, we want to put um, that the cell grows larger and organelles increase. The cell grows larger and the organelles increase. Then you can see a little G0. G0 is an off-ramp, okay? So here's G1, we, right? Here is mitosis and cytokinesis. So you have a brand new baby cell, and so your organelles are doubling. G0 is when this cell is done dividing. No more division is taking place. So just think of it as an off-ramp of the cell cycle. And this is typical in muscles and nerves. So for instance, if somebody hurts themselves and has nerve damage in their spinal cord, and then that that can't be repaired because all the cells of the spinal cord are now in, in G0. If there was a way to turn them and get them off of G0, get them back in G1, then you could make more nerve cells, more neurons to repair the spinal cord. But once they have formed, they get to a certain point where they no longer divide, and that is in G0. Okay, and then S is DNA synthesis, duplication of chromosomes, and replication. So DNA replication, the S stands for synthesis. And G2 is when you really focus on making a bunch of proteins, getting ready to lead into mitosis. So mitosis is nuclear, on your notes, nuclear division. Two nuclei contain the exact same DNA as the parent cell. These two nuclei will contain the exact same complement of DNA as that parent cell. And then cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm where you're forming two cells. All right, now, how is all of this controlled? And we're going it's just your intro slide here, okay? Here are the basics, and this is right here from your notes, okay? So it's controlled by both internal and external signals. Let's add a little bit to your notes. On controlled by an external signal, you could put in here um, an external signal would be like a growth factor. A growth factor would be an external signal and an internal signal would be, let's say something went wrong in mitosis, so it could be due to DNA damage, all right? And then a signal is a molecule that either stimulates or inhibits some sort of metabolic event. And then an example of an external signal I gave you right here, all right? Um, now, let's talk about checkpoints. So I'm sure many of you have gone to an airport and you understand that in order to go from getting out of your car um, and getting onto that plane, there's, there's two things that have to happen. Number one, you have to show your ticket, right? For some people like here at LAX, um, an airport I would go, before you can even get very far in the airport, you have to show evidence of a ticket. And then the second thing is you have clearance. You have checkpoints to make sure that you're not bringing anything on the airplane that you should it. So I want to get this in your head. A ticket for, for the cell cycle are called cyclins. And at checkpoints, the cell is stopping in the middle of that cell cycle and going, did we do everything right? Um, should we move on to the next stage? Because if not, you're not getting on the airplane, you're not going forward. So let's take a look. All right. Do you see where you have these stop signs right here at M? You have one at G1 and you have at G2. Those would be like where you get, you know, your bags checked. Is everything all right? Then you can see right here, and I'm only showing you two, but there are multiple tickets you would have to actually show. Uh, the analogy kind of drops there. But cyclins, for instance, have to be present for you to go from the G1 where you made a bunch of organelles and you want to go into the S stage where you synthesize your DNA, getting ready for mitosis. You have to have these cyclins present in order to move into the S stage, just like you have to have other cyclins present to move from the G2 stage where you made a bunch of proteins to actually the nuclear division of mitosis. Um, the G1 is a very important checkpoint that you see right here. Think of this as like a checkpoint when you first enter to the, to the airport. Um, if mitosis is not done correctly, if mitosis is not done correctly, um, then that cell either needs to be fixed um, or destroyed because what what could then happen is you could have an out of control cell and that out of control cell would be cancer so 
that would be the worst event um, to have more of a damaged cell and then have that proliferate throughout your body. Okay, so on your notes, let's go to your notes for a minute here. On checkpoints, there are three, G1, G2, and M. The G1 checkpoint appears to be the most critical. The G1 checkpoint appears to be the most critical. The cell will remain in G0 if it does not receive the signal to move forward to the S stage. Let me go back so you can see where those are. Okay, so this one right here appears to be the most critical. And it'll just off-ramp into G0 if it can't be fixed. Um, and then ultimately it will get destroyed. So um, the, the cell is checked to see if the DNA is damaged um, or if it can't be repaired or chromosomes not lining up correctly. And then it's called apoptosis if they don't pass one of the checkpoints, okay? So if there's any trouble, then the cell needs to just die, commit cellular suicide. Cyclins, shown you a couple here. Cyclins um, are proteins that control the cell cycle and they must be present, they build up to move into these different stages. And let me show you um, a way to, let me spell that out for you here. Okay, so there's two things I want you to know on, remember this is cell communication underneath that umbrella, right? So let's talk about two big players, cyclins and CDKs. Um, cyclins are proteins that can activate um, enzymes, okay, that can activate enzymes, specifically CDKs. So here in our analogy, this is what our cyclin is going to look like, this right here, okay, in our modeling, excuse me. So CDKs stand for cyclin-dependent kinases. Remember we learned about kinases before, they have that ability to phosphate, um, to phosphorylize. So if we look here, here is a CDK, and he's got a little phosphate group right here, and when he's activated, he can either add a phosphate group to another molecule, which might turn that other molecule on, right, and start that enzyme cascade or possibly inactivating it. So it's like a switch. So the cyclin turns on the CDK and the CDK turns on another protein or turns off another protein and acts as a switch, okay? So here, Here's your cyclin. As the cyclins build up, as you're leading towards that next stage of the cell cycle, so now your cyclins are building up. When the cyclins build up, then this will then bind, this cyclin will come and bind onto the CDK. When the cyclins bind onto the CDK, then this CDK will then move a phosphate group okay, over to this protein who was off, and then it will turn that protein on, okay? It can also turn proteins that are on off, just depends on what that switch is. So on your notes, go to kinases, and these are enzymes, I've labeled it as an enzyme, okay? And um, it's activated by cyclins, so a cyclin would come and bind to the CDK, activated by cyclins, and when the cyclins deteriorate, so when these cyclins go away, they break down, and I'll show you an example of that, then the kinases become inactive. Similar to what we saw right before when we looked at, um, um, when we looked at um, adenylate cyclase, right, turning ATP into cyclic AMP, right, to turn on that enzyme cascade to make a bunch of glucose, right, from glycogen. And then we talked about how you would take the phosphate group off, right, to turn this whole process off. It's that same song and dance repeating itself. And you can see, here's the big factor, this phosphate group, right, moving this phosphate group from one molecule to another. So let's look at another example here. Here are several different cyclins that you can see. And and these, remember the cyclins, if we're going back to our airport analogy, these um, are like the ticket, right, to move you into the next stage of the cell cycle. Look right here, G1, S phase, G2, and then your M phase. Okay, now I'm going to kind of go, I'll, I'll help you with your notes here in just a minute, but let's look at this example. First of all, recognize your cell cycle here. So here's G1, S, G2 and M. So look right here, this cyclin is accumulating. The cyclin then will bind to the CDKs. And then when they do that, they're a cyclin CDK complex. In this case, it's called an MPF when they're bound together like that. 
for maturation or mitosis promoting factor because we're right here at this checkpoint we're trying to get through and move into the M stage. Once we move into that M stage, the ticket breaks down. It's kind of like once you've used that ticket, you can't use it again. The ticket breaks down and that inactivates then your CDK. Your cyclin-dependent kinase is no longer active. And so then that cyclin has decreased and some other cyclins would need to increase to move it on to the next stage. Okay, now um, go into your notes on your example. Okay, so cyclin binds to kinase, producing enough of the product MPF. Here's our MPF right here. Mitosis promoting factor, mitosis promoting factor or maturation promoting factor, which will push the cell through the G2 stage and into that M stage. Later in the M stage, um, the cyclins begin to be destroyed to stop that M phase so you can move on into your G1 stage. Now, I'm going to show you something from your... Um, Highly suggested reading and thinking. Let me just show you one more time. Here's your mitotic cyclin, right? Binding to the um, CDK, activating it, moving into the M stage. When you start to move through that, then the cyclin will get deteriorated. These are some of the things that need to happen in order to move into mitosis and in the first stages of it. I know this looks terrifying. What I want to tell you is what I've shown you so far is an oversimplification. Look at all of these CDKs, and not even all of them are shown here, okay? Look at all the different CDKs, look at all the different cyclins, and they all have to work together. This takes intense cellular communication to make this process happen. Look right here at your M stage, where, um, and moving into your G1, see this G0 right here, right? That's the off-ramp. I want you to look right here, see this CDK4 cyclin right here, this combination, what that's going to going to do is it's going to start to the phosphorylation process of something called RB. It stands for retinoblastoma. Okay. And it is bound to something called E2F. Now I'm showing you in a very complex way. So if you ever, any of these things come up in any of your essays, they will not intimidate you. And I'll show you uh, some words to go along with this if you want to see that in just a moment. Just bear with me. So CDK4 and cyclin is going to start the phosphorylation process of RB, which is connected to E2F. Once that occurs, that's going to turn on and promote the CDK2 cyclin E process, which then triggers the phosphorylated RB to release the E2F, which then triggers this next CDK2 cyclin A stage. So it's like this triggers this, triggers this, triggers this, right? So here's just a little bit of background on that. If you wanted to pause and read about it a little bit, be my guest, but you can see right here, initiating phosphorylation of the ret um, retinoblastoma, the PRB right here, thus promoting the activation of the CDK2 cyclin, which is then gonna release the E2F, which then triggers this. If you just wanted to read about it, you're not going to be held accountable at that level. I just wanted you to see those details. Now, what if um, any of this goes bad? What if all of these controls that we just talked about um, goes bad? So I'm going to move myself over here. Then what happens is apoptosis, cellular suicide. Because if in this step something goes wrong and you have cells getting promoted to continue and make more cells, but their DNA is damaged, then we need to stop the cell, right, at one of those checkpoints, try and fix it. If you cannot fix it, then we need this cell to commit suicide. Um, and all of this is there's a gene um, called the P53 gene that codes for a P53 protein uh, that codes for that P53 protein. And then the cellular death is caused by, they're called caspases that encourage this apoptosis. You know how I remember this is so dumb, but I think of Casper the friendly ghost, you know who that is? So ghost is dead. So caspases trigger this cellular, um, they're the kind of hitman on the cell. These are the enzymes that will end up destroying the cell. So on your notes, apoptosis is defined as programmed cell death, and it's a balance between mitosis and apoptosis that helps maintain the normal cell 
the normal level of somatic cells preventing a tumor from developing. And death is caused by enzymes called caspases that are normally kept in check by inhibitors, but it's like they're inhibiting the caspases and then they're released if the cell is damaged and internal or external signals can um, deactivate those inhibitors. All right, so that's control of the cell cycle. Now let's look at what actually happens during the stages of mitosis. So in order to do that, we need to get a good idea of what the cell looks like. So what you're looking at right now would be a cell in interphase. So this is G1, S, and G2 of interphase. It looks something like this. You can see um, right here, okay, is the nucleus. This, uh, this line I'm highlighting right here is the nucleus. Outside on the edges here, this would be the organelles out here in the cytoplasm, maybe some rough ER. This dark area right here is the nucleolus. Now when you stain, so primarily what you're looking at here is the nucleus, right? When you stain it, the dark staining, like this right here, these dark purple look, looking colors inside the nucleus, this is actually um, inactive DNA, non-active DNA. This DNA is tightly coiled on these proteins um, called histone proteins and it's coiled and put away. And that's why it stains so well because it's concentrated. This U, that's called heterochromatin. This euchromatin, this lighter color in here, this is where active DNA would be. So it doesn't take a stain because it's all unwound and exposed. Now, when the stage actually goes into, when the cell goes into the stages of mitosis, which are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, when you go into those stages, all of this DNA is gonna to have to get condensed and organized into rod-shaped chromosomes so that you can make sure you accurately separate all the information. But for 90% of the time, the nucleus looks just like this. And this will change. What's heterochromatin versus euchromatin will change throughout the day. It could change throughout the month. It will change throughout your lifetime about which DNA is active or inactive. So on chromosome, um, structure this is where we are right now okay so i want to show you when it gets coiled up here we go when it gets ready for mitosis then what you just saw there that euchromatin heterochromatin has to wind itself up into these rod like structures now you can see there are two standing right here these are called sister chromatids but as long as those sister chromatids are joined together they are called a single chromosome now what do those consist of when your original DNA, and I know this is a lot to take in, but I know you can do it. Here's your DNA, it's double helix. It unwinds, it unzips, and free nucleotides come in on either half. So you have now two copies of the DNA. So this represents one copy, and this is another copy of all those genes or chromosomes. And when the chromosomes first become visible in mitosis, they appear double like that. So you can send one of these chromatids to one cell and the other chromatid to another cell. And the part that holds them together right here is called the centromere, centromere sorry. All right, now how, this is just, here you go. Dude, mitosis starts in five minutes. I can't believe you're not condensed yet. So it's gonna come from this, this thing that looks like a hairball or something that your cat coughed up into these rod shaped chromosomes. Now, this would happen, if you, you're gonna be starting really zoomed in and then you're backing up, I want you to look right here. Here's your DNA double helix. And what it's starting to do is this right here, double helix, is this strand right here. It starts to wind itself around what these are called histone proteins. And these eight histone proteins, like these purple balls that you see right here, they are called a nucleosome. And it's a way to organize the DNA. And it's kind of, it winds it, the DNA like around a spool. And that spool is that nucleosome. So you start winding it up and then winding it up some more. And we're backing up farther and farther, winding up, winding it, winding it until you see this one chromosome. Now in class, the analogy I would give for this is if you just took three hairs and you braided that, and then you braided those together, and then you braided those together, and then you braided those together till you had one big braid, okay? That's what I think of when I think of this chromosome right here. So let's see, um, go into chromosome structure on your notes. Following S and G2 stages um, of interphase, the cells prepare for mitosis. The chromatin, which is this DNA plus proteins, start to coil up into two rod shapes, 
joined by a centromere, rod shapes joined by a centromere. The two copies of the DNA, there's one for each cell, right? Those sister chromatids. So the organization DNA winds around histone protein spools. Let me see, I've written this out for you so you can see it. Histone protein spools um, that form a nucleosome. So eight histones form one nucleosome. Um, the nucleosomes then begin coiling until condensed into a chromosome. Condensed into a chromosome. Now, there are other proteins inside the nucleus as well um, called non histone proteins. And these are probably regulatory in function, in function, turning on certain genes to be expressed. Okay. So um, here, this is one chromatid, right? And here's its sister chromatid. They are exactly the same and they are held together by a centromere. And you will start to see these chromosomes do this as you are in the stage of prophase. That's when they start to become visible as rod-shaped chromosomes. Now, I need to explain another term for you, um, some other terms, haploid versus diploid, all right? You and I are diploid organisms. We have two sets of chromosomes. We got one set from our mom and we got one set from our dad. So you have two chromosome number ones, one that came from mom and one that came from dad. During the S stage of interphase, your mom and dad chromosomes are each gonna duplicate. So these are sister chromatids, per this chromosome, and these are sister chromatids per this chromosome. This is called a homologous pair. They are the same size, the same shape, and they code for the same characteristics. One came from mom, one came from dad. These are sister chromatids. This is considered one chromosome as long as they are together. We are diploid. So we have um, two copies of every trait. As long as you're a female, you have two copies of two of every of every trait because your 23rd pair of chromosomes are called your sex chromosomes. And for females, that's an X and an X. That's what makes us female. For guys, it's an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, which is really small. That's why I kind of folded my fingers here. So that is not a homologous pair because you got your X from your biological mother and you got your Y from your biological father. So that would not be, they are the 23rd pair, but they are very different. Now, we have a total of 46 chromosomes, but if you look, um, if you look right here, a potato has 48, okay? 48 chromosomes, which means it has 24 homologous pairs. So does tobacco, right? So you can look at some of these others. You can look at this fern. It has over 1,300 chromosomes that make that are inside of its nucleus. A frog right here, it has 26 chromosomes, which means it has that it has um, 13 homologous pairs. So we are a diploid, which means we have two copies, one from each parent. So when, um, let's see, let me, I got to get you caught up here. On chromosome appearance during interphase, it will look like a solid nucleus during interphase. The DNA is unwound. It replicates during the S stage, but no noticeable change under a microscope. But during mitosis, the chromosomes form and appear as doubled sister chromatids, and they are held together by a centromere. Then now you're on 9.3 on the numbers. Um, a diploid number is 2N. And um, the N represents, like for us, we're 46 chromosomes, right? So our N number is 23. And what happens, I know this is a lot, let me get bigger here for just a minute. The sperm, okay, the sperm will have 23 chromosomes in it from your biological father, that's the N number. And the egg from your mother will have 23 chromosomes. So 23 and 23, 2N is 46, okay? For a potato, okay, for a potato, it'll be 24 is a haploid number and 24, and then the 2N number, two times 24 would be 48, all right? So diploid number is the full complement, all right? So the diploid number 2N, when you have two full sets of chromosomes, one set from each parent as found in somatic cells, your body cells, only your sperm or egg have the haploid number, right? Um, and we'll talk about the process of making that haploid number when we discuss myomyomiosis, which is getting ready for sex. But that's another day, okay? The haploid number N is when you have only one set of chromosomes, a mixture of parental chromosomes, sperm or egg, and those are called gametes. But that's another chapter. All right, so now, 
Let's break down those stages. Okay, so one chromosome again is made out of two sister chromatids. And so what we need to do is we need to line up all of our chromosomes and make sure each cell gets one of these chromatids. So the big picture on that, okay, let's take a look at this cell. This is not you or I, right? If you count, there are one, two, three, four chromosomes in this cell. So if there's a total of four chromosomes, right, four chromosomes, the 2n number is four, right? And we could say that the the blue chromosomes right here came from this individual's biological father and the red chromosomes came from the biological mother. Let's take these biggest chromosomes right there. That would be a homologous pair, a homologous pair. So we have chromosome one from dad and we have chromosome one from mom. And then our second homologous pair, this, this smaller red one right here from mom, smaller blue one here from dad. So they have a total of four chromosomes. But what they're gonna need to do is make all of those are gonna replicate themselves, all four chromosomes, all four chromosomes are gonna line up and we're gonna divide so that each daughter cell gets the full four chromosomes just like the original parent cell. And that's what mitosis does. It makes takes that original cell and it makes clones of it. So all we need to know is at what stage, what's kind of the dance of the chromosome, what's occurring. Because we wanna generate for mitosis two identical cells, two identical cells. All right, so let's just go through, this is the easiest part, just going through the stages. So this right here, look where you see early prophase, prophase, and late prophase. Basically, prophase, there's a lot of action that goes on. First of all, the DNA is already replicated because that happened during the S stage of interphase, but what those chromosomes have to do is condense into those rod-shaped chromosomes like we talked about. So you can see that happening. Here's the DNA condensing into those rod-shaped chromosomes. The other thing is we need to get rid of the nuclear envelope and the nucleolus, okay, because those are gonna get in the way of separating out those chromosomes. So you can see that happens. Look right here, remember those things that look like churros? The centrioles in animal cells, it, they duplicate. And what happens is they start migrating to either end. And so now they're on, by the time we get to the end of prophase, they're on either end and microtubules, remember those are made out of nine groups of three, Remember the microtubules when we looked at the, the centrioles, but now they're just shooting out individual microtubules across the cell. And what I think about, what the analogy I give is like it's a clothesline and you're gonna hang up your clothes, your jeans on this clothesline right here. So they're all getting attached to these microtubules. And then those are gonna help pull the, the um, sister chromatids apart in our stages. All right, so we're getting ready for that. So for prophase, the chromosomes consisting of the two chromatids become visible. The chromatids become visible. The nuclear envelope and the nucleolus disappear. They break down. And the centrosomes with the spindle fibers, so this is a centrosome right here. Okay, where the centrioles are sitting is in the centrosome. The centrosomes with the spindle fibers move to the poles. The microtubules extend from the centrioles all around it. This is called an aster. Think of like an asteroid. Okay, and now we're ready to move into metaphase. And I always say they meet, they meet in the middle at metaphase. All your chromosomes are lined up single file. So chromosomes meet in the middle. And this whole microtubule complex you're looking at right here, that's referred to as the spindle. Um, and then in anaphase, it's like they're here. And what you're seeing is they're getting pulled apart. That's why they look like V's towards each other. The sister chromatids are getting pulled like this apart. So I always think away at anaphase. So sister chromatids pulled and pushed apart. Um, there's little motor molecules, kinesin and dynin, that assist in this process. You don't have to memorize all of that. And then the cells begin the process that leads to the destruction of the cyclins because remember we had the M cyclins to move into this stage. Um, which inactivates the CDK molecules and it's gonna bring about the end to mitosis. Um, then in telophase, this is when you're starting to rebuild your nuclear envelope. Look from anaphase to telophase, you're rebuilding your nuclear envelope 
and your nucleolus. And also simultaneously what's happening is cytokinesis. You're starting to divide the cytoplasm. So telophase, the nuclear membranes with the nucleolus reform, and then sister chromatids now called chromosomes, they are going to start to unwind back into that because they're going to transition now back into interphase, specifically G1. So cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. And animal cells, because we don't have a cell wall, that cytokinesis happens like a pinching off and separating in animal style. But in plants, let's look at a plant cell. Here you can see the chromosomes becoming visible, right? Here's metaphase, they're meeting in the middle. Anaphase, away at anaphase. Telophase is division of the nucleus, right? That's you're finishing it up and reforming the nuclear envelope. But for them, when cytokinesis happens, they can't pitch off. They actually have to build a new cell wall. So it starts with the cell plate and then it becomes a cell wall. So here, right here, you can see that starting to build. So on cytokinesis, you have division of cell forming two cells forming two cells. In animal cells, you have what's called the cleavage furrow. Let me go back here. Okay, let me go back one more. Here you go. This is called the cleavage furrow when it happens um, inside the plasma membrane, but in plant cells, there we go. In plant cells, the cell walls do not permit furrowing. Instead, a cell plate forms, which will become a cell wall. All right, boy, that was a lot, huh? I know. Okay, so what's the whole, oh, here's a good summary for you, okay? You can see G2 leading into the stages of mitosis, and this, in case you wanted to pause the video here, you could catch a screenshot and add this to your notes. It describes what's happening in every stage, and again, into cytokinesis, okay? But what's the point of mitosis? Mitosis by somatic cells is for growth and repair for growth and repair. Um, what cells continue this process? Stem cells, like in your red bone marrow, will always be making more cells, right? Stem cells, like in your red bone marrow, can, conti can continue to replicate and form new cells. However, right, at some point you stop growing, but in plant cells, they'll continue to grow at least off either end, and that's called meristematic tissue, and that will continue throughout their lifetime. So meristematic tissue in plants can always do mitosis. Now, the harvesting of stem cells, right, you're going to have a highly suggested reading and thinking about stem cells and about cloning, and I'm going to let you read that um, when you do that. All right, so that is the end of part one. I know that was a lot. You did a great job though. And I'm gonna make a part two video when we talk about when uh, good cells go bad and what that looks like in cancer. All right, hang in there.